Hi, my name is Katina Michael and I'm your instructor for PIT 502, a core course in the new Master of Science in Public Interest Technology. The core course title is Co-Designing the Future. Let's go over the course's learning objectives. It's always good to reiterate them after each week, so whenever we're at. At the completion of this course, students will be able to demonstrate the ability to work as a team. Now that team at the moment, because of COVID is quite virtual. Uh, many of us are not um, co-locating and we're social distancing. So our team is made up of varied um, stakeholder types and our team doesn't necessarily have to be an internal sort of a student team, uh, your peers in 502. Uh, they may well be stakeholders outside the university as pertaining to your public interest technology project. And so the second course learning objective is to develop or engage in a public interest tech project using a co-design methodology. And we've had lots of discussion in week one about what that public interest technology project might be. We've discussed that it may not necessarily have uh, a shiny gadget uh, as part of its um, purview. Uh, it may well be a process or a technique rather than a shiny technology like an a mobile phone or an app. And we're also going to be exposed continuously to co-design as a way of thinking, as a methodology, as a way to incorporate end users and to give people who don't necessarily have a voice a voice and also to give diverse voices a chance uh, at the table equally as they're co-located sitting next to different types of stakeholders that could be manufacturers, government agencies, uh, local councils, uh, and so many, so many more different types of stakeholders. I want you to be able to design across one or more vertical applications. And for many of you, it's not just the process that you're engaged in in public interest technology, it's also applying it to a vertical sector or a vertical application area, such as transport, utilities, healthcare, housing, safety, and so many more. And to be able to elicit and analyze end users' needs to innovate responsibly. I know some of you never see end users. End users in your workplace have not even come into your radar because it's usually about developing for end users and not with them. But in this course, we're taking end users along for the journey towards empowerment. So not only do we want to hear what their needs are, but they become co-producers and co-creators in this design process called co-design. So we're at week three. This is the discover stage. Okay, we've finished the build the conditions, the immerse and align, and now we're at discover. So in week one, what we did is we brainstormed about what public interest technology was, what your interests were, how they aligned and intersected with this course. We then immersed ourselves in the literature and aligned ourselves with key stakeholders and asked somebody, please, would you do an interview with me? I've got a keen interest in this particular public interest technology area. You were able to conduct that interview, transcribe that interview, clean that interview up, perhaps even if you had an opportunity, go back to the interviewee and ask them, are you happy with the output? Is there anything you would change? And next week, we go towards design. And I'm very excited about next week, but before we get there, let's talk about Discover. So in this module, number three, the learning outcomes are as follows. A student will be able to tell stories and write short narratives around public interest technology cases. Please don't underestimate that after you've conducted a full length interview of one hour, you've done research in order to garner what those questions might be for the interview, you've created the interview protocol, you've probed and you've received responses and you've you know, learned uh, a great deal about your context. Um, the ability to tell the story is such a key skill set in your arena. It's the ability to convey the story to somebody else, it's to write it in a short narrative style like a paragraph and say, this is what's going on in summary, you know, and we're going to find it very interesting um, how some of these 
stories are told, but also how we arrive at the stories. And I've already encouraged some of you to think about podcasting, to think about very short videos, two minutes, 30 seconds even, to try and get a response um, from your constituency. The second learning outcome is to collect and collate primary and secondary sources of evidence by engaging with key stakeholders. For example, searching local news archives, county and municipal records and online sources to name a few. So it's not just a primary interview. Primary interviews always give us a depth of understanding. They may give us new leads that we hadn't thought about before. Like who else could we um, interview, for example? Uh, they may well provide us um, with what I call golden nugget moments. That is like the key um, issues uh, within a public interest technology case. And then I want you to be able to distill the main pains, the issues or challenges um, that the interviewee or the secondary sources of evidence uh, allowed you to find. And this is really about your pit case study. So what were the main pains? What were the issues? Why were they there? What were the reasons for them? Uh, and how possibly could we make things better? And finally, I want you to have the skill to take an interview, a qualitative piece of writing uh, and discussion, and to be able to do something like a pain chain chart. So if there are a number of issues that are covered in the interview, how can we translate those issues from an interview format to a pain chain chart that is able to distill and show us, aha, uh -huh, these are the main issues, these are the main challenges. And finally, to be able to do things like create a stakeholder chart which is like a table of stakeholders and descriptions and an opportunity identification to overcome the pains and the challenges and to be able to write uh, a brief uh, value proposition. So here we are at this third step, one, two, three, four, five, six, and our number seven is the pitch day. So we've finished build the conditions, immerse and align, and today we're at the discover stage. So we're at almost the midpoint of this process before we get to report on it in an oral presentation. And at the discover stage, we're asking three key questions. What is happening in the context? What is already strong? Because we must not underestimate that there are good things already happening. And what are the people longing for? And the people are actually the end users. What do they want? And in this instance, I've got something depicted sludge coming out of a, a sewage pipe. Uh, we've got rubbish being dumped uh, through this. Uh, we've got a, a tanker that's sort of got oil spilling into the ocean, obviously it's something to do with pollution in the ocean uh, and the need for clean oceans. And we've got the people here longing to clean this mess up and to figure out where it's coming from. Some of it's toxic as we can see here. Um, so this is just one example. So in the what is happening question, well, how do we know what is happening unless we ask people what's happening? And that's why I've got you to do an interview. You're actually at the cold face going, what's happening? Tell me, I'm listening, I'm documenting, I'm writing, I'm telling your story, I'm giving you a voice. And how do we know what is happening if we never leave our office or our homes to do a location or a situational or a contextual survey? And in survey, I don't mean like a, a geo survey, or a survey that gives you statistics. But actually, the person who's the co-designer or the you know, co-developer has to see what they're talking about. They have to physically visit this location. And they can take pictures. They can participate as observers in different ways. Um, and this is really important. Doing desk studies remotely on a particular cause is often misguided. But not everyone has the budget to allow people, for example, from organizations to do interstate travel, to see it with their own eyes. The people who know most about what is going on are usually the people on the ground. This is especially true when we are speaking of social implications. It is civil society who walks the harbors. They're the adopters of new technologies that are sold in the market. They're the users of infrastructure in neighborhoods. They ride on public transport. They can tell you if a bus is late. They can also tell you the condition of the bus. Uh, they frequent parks and shopping malls, and they're also first to protest when something doesn't work or is working the wrong way. 
Now, asking more than one person, for example, in a focus group context, is one way of garnering what the facts are, right? Single interviews are not generalizable. You have to know that. They're very insightful, but they're not generalizable. And I have uh, in the week two readings um, a lot on uh, focus groups and um, interviews uh, by Stanford University. There's a good PDF document about 30 pages long, which I suggest you do read. If for your applied projects later uh, in the next semester, you start thinking about doing something related to, um, let's say, uh, a focus group rather than a single case study or a single interview. So you may be able to do several interviews with stakeholders. Perhaps if there are nine stakeholder types, you choose to do nine interviews. Um, although I think nine would be too many for an applied project. Uh, six would probably be better. Um, but also you may choose to do one focus group where you invite the key stakeholders to the table and ensure that they turn up. Now, that's a good point because some stakeholders don't want to turn up to roundtables. They feel quite threatened and they actually think sometimes roundtables are a waste of time. So key participants are good to have because that's when you can have dialogue. If key stakeholders don't turn up or turn up for five minutes and say they have to leave, it's not good enough. So the co-design philosophy requires you to be mixing with the end users. They're not to be at arm's length somewhere over there where you can't see them in the next room. And to call a spade a spade, most citizens are to the point, uh, they're knowledgeable about a particular issue in their local constituency, and they don't really have much time uh, to spare. So please know how important it is that somebody gives up 30 minutes or 60 minutes of their time to talk to you in an interview, or somebody turns up to a local town hall that you're holding in order to provide some support and offer their insights and reflections. So it's to ask the end user, what are the problems as you understand them? How will we overcome them? And yes, I should document the concerns, but where do you want those documents to go? Are we responding to a consultative process with the local government? What are we doing with that information? And listening folks is not just passive, but it's active. You need to do something with the information that is given to you. Now, as background assumptions, never assume that no one has taken up your pit cause in your given case, right? That's very important. So you start a project, all enthusiastic, oh, you find out somebody's already started this about two years ago, four years ago, maybe longer. You don't panic and say, what will I do? You actually do your homework diligently. You look at what's been done to date, and then you set up a time to meet that key stakeholder that may have progressed the cause that you want to be a part of. In fact, you may well be volunteering with them, but also they may have learned things about coordination that you need to know regarding the local constituency. Team up virtually with people, read as many blog posts and comments to blog posts, like social media comments that you possibly can. Look at news media archives, get the story in your head holistically as much as you can. You know, this person thinks this, this person thinks that, who's really to blame for the toxicity in the water in this area, um, et cetera, et cetera. So as much as possible, try to engage the leading voices in your um, specialty, in your specific case. Remember, communities are always looking for volunteers to advance their peak calls. You may not be able to join them, but invite them to join you. So that's just some food for thought with regards to the discover stage. And really it's about users being very specific with their needs and then you have insights. And these are the insights we're talking about today. So the following slides uh, between here uh, and maybe in 20 or so slides come from IBM's e-business selling workshop. Uh, and I had the joy of teaching with this material back in 2001. 2002, um, created by the IBM Learning Services, which was a worldwide certified program. And I had a number of students uh, going through this program uh, who were qualified but not certified uh, to complete these exercises. And it so happens that in the discover stage, that's what we're doing. We're building pain chains. 
this is a hypothetical group assignment, you know, develop a key players list, develop the list of critical business issues and reasons facing the key players, develop the pain chain showing the interdependence of the issues and reasons at this fictitious company called Universal Floor Care. And this is how perhaps um, a flat 2D table would look with the key players down the side and the pains in the middle and the reasons for those pains on the right. Now, given you've done a single interview, you've got a single key player. The name will be repeated right down that list, but the pains or the issues that they identify or the challenges will be different on every single one of those um, cells. And then the reasons for those pains are also listed here, whatever they may be. When I translate that flat table into sort of a, a interlinking chart, I've got this particular chart being squished into like sort of little cards, okay? So this person is the CEO. This person is the VP of marketing. Um, this person is the VP of some other area um, management. This one is the COO. This one's the chief financial officer and so forth. And they're talking about maybe two to three pains for each individual. So if I look at this particular um, staffer, fictitious, more cash, uh, the pain is eroding profits. And the reason for that is the rising costs. Another one is for the declining revenues. Now, somewhere else, there may be a pain chain which talks about um, decreasing demand, misshipping services, parts, storage, inventory mix, may well be the reason that profits are eroding. And so there is a link between these two blocks boxes um, and different stakeholders may be sharing the same pain points but they may feel they have different reasons for those pains so that's always very important to remember but this is what I expect you to hand in a pain chain chart now this shows us um, how business processes um, are linked. And I, the reason why I've included this slide is not so much because of the verticals here, of which I want you to have some exposure in the industry segment, but the process that is relevant to this. So if you were, for example, working on a, on a pit case study in health, obviously the, the subgroups would be um, a variety of subgroups in the health, it could be local GPs, it could be hospitals, it could be whatever it might be. And the process may be the rollout of the vaccine or, or something relevant um, to a process or a technology. But you can see here, IBM had 156 customer interviews completed and 37 case studies in order to come out with this and more. Again, as they dug deeper, 500 customer interviews, 500, over 125 cases, over 40 industry roadmaps. So you get to see that the follow-up on the work is really important to large corporates just as much as it is to smaller players in the market. And the whole point here is there are two stages. There's the get business process, which is like the setting requirements. And then there's the do business, the selecting the solutions and actually going through with it. So at each one of those stages, there is a selection, a satisfaction, awareness and evaluation process that keeps going around. And in this case, it's um, anti-clockwise, the selection, satisfaction, advocacy, awareness, and so forth. And the word uh, advocacy is new here. But basically, you set the requirements, and then you select the solutions. For many players in the market, they don't come into the task at hand while the requirements are being set. They miss that phase and want to skip directly to selecting the solution. And this is the difference between these sort of systems development life cycles and also the life cycles that I deal with uh, on a daily basis, uh, which are more on the co-design part. So selecting solutions is not when the vendor comes in, they should be coming in right at the beginning when requirements are being defined, but the same with the pit stakeholders. Rather than waiting to actually do the work, get in there early and affect the way design happens and affect the way 
uh, you would be influencing the process. And so in corporate environments, what you've got in the get business process are these individuals that are were once named techno evangelists. So I remember where I was in the States when I uh, first uh, got a business card with this notion of what an evangelist was. And they were a technology evangelist. And uh, interesting with how the perceptions are with high potential prospects. And I'm using language now that is non pit related, but it's very important for you to see that in the adjoining corporate kind of fluency, there is also now what we're going to have here in this class, a pit emergent fluency of how we talk about things. So in the pit world, you might be talking about reducing costs and increasing efficiency and improving customer satisfaction and increasing revenues. But really this kind of return on investment mentality and payback period mentality and it being about cash flow changes somewhat in the pit realm. It doesn't mean that we you know, don't maximize our profits in a pit context, but usually public interest technology is not really about generating new profits such that you make your shareholders wealthier. It's more about um, action that is taking place uh, to overcome an injustice. So when we look at environmental injustices, uh, pit is there to, yes, perhaps reduce costs, but in actual fact, it may well be increasing costs by not allowing a stakeholder to do particular types of practice. You know, if you're saying no to mining in an area uh, where helium could be extract extracted, then uh, you won't be very popular uh, with those who want to actually conduct the mining, okay? And then the evangelist goes through, looks at potential solutions that are productized in the corporate realm and corporate mindset, you know, like the e-commerce solution, the e-collaboration solution, the CRM solution, the supply chain management and web application servers. And then they identify individual applications that go into that solution suite, whatever the um, vertical is. And then they have a vision Okay, a business case, they align. They look at the functional requirements. And then around about this stage, they select a solution, implement, get the support of an independent software vendor and ISV, and then perhaps, you know, there they go very happy. So there is this get business and then this do business process once again. And the lack of demonstrated business value is a key ad adoption roadblock for e-business solutions, right? So if you cannot demonstrate in a corporate setting business value, then the project will suffer. The thing with public interest technology though, is that it's an easy sell. I mean, everyone knows that um, blind people should have the right to access web pages or, um, you know, when there's pollution in a local river or there's been some damage to something that it, it should be rectified, right? Um, it'll cost the stakeholder money to clean up the local river. It'll cost the stakeholder money to do these um, beneficial uh, exercises, but that nobody usually wants to pay for. So, it's not a panacea co-design or pit because quite possibly you have some other financial burdens that you can't overcome. But when we're talking about the public interest, somehow we've got to find a way to overcome them. And I've constantly said throughout the whole of this course, it's with new business models. The op opportunity identification worksheet, you know, in pros, we'll have the opportunity description there and what type of solution would be required and who the key influencer varies uh, with the key player. The value proposition template, um, it'd be good to have a go with respect to your public interest tech project. Um, it shows seriousness, but also what are you trying to achieve? And you won't be saying by this much percent or 
uh, you know, IBM being the enabler or whatever, you've just got to be true to yourself in that value proposition with respect to the interview, but also, uh, I guess, um, what you'll do in translating that interview on how to overcome challenges and offer holistic solutions. IBM also had this nine block model in action. Just show you an example. This is what it was like when it was empty. Diagnose the reasons, explore the impact and visualize the capabilities in an open context, control and confirm. So here was a perspective um, sum. Tell me about it. What is causing you to have this repeat pain, for example? You're trying to diagnose why. Why is this pain occurring? Besides yourself, who in your organization is impacted by this? Okay, explore the impact and then visualize the capabilities. What is it going to take for you to be able to solve this repeat pain? And then is it because, is this pain causing? What if there was a way for you to blah? And then to confirm. So the reason for your pain is, from what I just heard, repeat exactly what you heard. And then from what I just heard, if you had the ability, you would. You know, to overcome the pain. You also have a pain sheet situational fluency prompter, which helps you with each of the situations and stakeholders to be able to go from reasons to impact to capabilities, because that's really the whole idea here. If you've got a problem, we need to address this problem and let's offer some capabilities to do that. And that may well be technical or technological capabilities, that may well be social or otherwise. So remember, PIT is not Shark Tank. It never will be. I'd say it's the opposite to Shark Tank. However, some of the themes we've addressed in the last sort of 20 to 30 minutes will end up becoming recurring themes in public interest technology. Even when you get judges to come to judge a project, they will ask this question. So I hope this course encourages you to adopt the PIT mindset in your workplace, you know, uh, and it's quite simple to do. It doesn't have to be, oh, we've got to change our gate process uh, and build things in a different way, you know, with the same level of resourcing. But it's at first, um, it doesn't have to be the full thing. You know, you may be in a, a group meeting, you may ask a question. You don't usually ask in a team meeting. Um, a part of the budget that might incorporate participatory or co-design practices included, involving an end user before the design process begins. I think these are the kinds of um, things we've got to work on. And not to be afraid that we are alone in our workplace. I think the common sense I've heard in this classroom uh, gives me great hope uh, that it will carry on in other settings. So a co-design framework for public service design looks at planning and then recruiting and then planning some more and recruiting some more. And the recruitment sometimes is of end users who are diverse. Um, we look at the sensitivity and the facility, uh, very much a case of um, common sense making and then building for change. Right, that's the get business again and the do business, the requirements and the solutions. All of these go hand in hand together. So, finally, a key word list. I always finish on this. Um, please know the context of what I'm talking about here and why I include this um, stories, narratives, interviews, primary sources, secondary sources, transcription, uh, primary stakeholders, key informants, manufacturers, users, citizens, viewpoints, diverse voices, discovery, pains reasons for the pain, solutions, challenges, issues, um, situation fluency, value proposition, holistic approach, citizen scientists, rate payers, chambers of commerce, evidence, statistics, bureaus, business operators, municipal county, media and developers. So that's it from me for week three. I hope you've enjoyed this discovery um, lecture and next week I look forward to being with you for the week for design.